Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or good evening as the case may be. Welcome to another United States Study Center webinar. My name is Simon Jackman. I'm the CEO of the United States Study Center and a uh, professor of political science here at the University of Sydney. Uh, today, we're so delighted to be joined by Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, former National Security Advisor in the administration of uh, Donald Trump, who will be joined in conversation uh, with Charles Adele, uh, non-resident fellow here at the United States Study Center, uh, John Lee, and the author of a recent report on the Quad, um, Lavina Lee. Um, I'm going to get out of the way very quickly, but I couldn't let this opportunity uh, being joined today by General McMaster go without a few comments about the significance of today's event for the United States Study Center. We've got almost 400 people registered for this event today um, that span an enormous number of people in the Australian government, in the business community, in academia, from media, and of course, interested members of the lay public. Thank you all for joining us today. Today, we double down on the mission of the United States Study Center, and that is to educate Australians about the United States and about Australia's relationship with the United States and turning adversity in, into opportunity. These webinars that we've been able to bring you over the last couple of months have, have given us an amazing opportunity using the deep networks that the United States Study Center has through its, its networks, through having people like Charlie and John and Levine associated with the center to be able to reach out uh, to someone with a distinguished uh, career uh, in, in national security and of service to his nation more generally. Uh, uh, that's, uh, of course, I'm referring to Lieutenant General McMaster. Um, we look forward to the next 55, 57 minutes or so. Uh, and of course, consistent with just this amazing run of speakers we've been able to bring you over the last couple of months and we anticipate being able to continue to bring you. It's, it's remarkable how we've been able to turn what is on its face a remarkably adverse set of circumstances into an unrivaled opportunity uh, to, to the, the quality of the people we're engaged with uh, from the United States and the frequency with which we're doing so. And of course, the audience that we're reaching here in Australia through this, this, uh, this technology. So thank you in advance for joining us today. Thank you in advance to General McMaster and, and with that, Charlie, I will hand over the rest of proceedings today to you. Thank you so much uh, for, for organizing today. Well, thanks very much, Simon. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for a discussion about whether or not the Quad will ever work. Uh, the Quad, of course, is shorthand for the quadrilateral relationship between Australia, the United States, Japan, and India. Uh, its origins date back to 2004, when the Boxing Day tsunami devastated large portions of Southeast Asia and South Asia. Uh, the US, Japan, Australia, and India quickly pulled together a flotilla of vessels to deliver humanitarian relief, highlighting the potential for maritime cooperation between these four countries, all of which are democracies and all of which are maritime powers. Despite increasing diplomatic uh, collaboration and joint naval exercises and training, in 2008, Australia abruptly withdrew from the Quad, decisively ending the fledgling entity. But today, the Quad is back. As China has shown itself to be increasingly aggressive in the East China Sea, the South China Sea, and now into the Indian Ocean as well, the strategic logic of this grouping of nations working together is again coming into focus. The value of the Quad is both positive, building a common approach to regional challenges based on shared values and similar interests, and negative, preventing China from dominating the region. But, and here's the question, can it actually work? Canberra, Washington, Tokyo, and Delhi might find common cause in balancing against China, but differences in threat perception, in the desired objective, in trade dependencies, and in resource allocation continue to challenge the collective strength of the Quad. Given these dynamics, what should we expect from the Quad? Can the Quad effectively counter China's aggressive behavior in the region? Could the Quad offer countries in the region an affirmative and indeed an attractive agenda 
in terms of commerce, investment, infrastructure, and development. To answer those questions, we have a spectacular group of speakers today. Uh, first, Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, U.S. Army retired, is the inaugural holder of the Japan Chair at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C. He's also the Fuad and Michelle Ajami Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institute. General McMaster was the 26th Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. He served as a commissioned officer in the United States Army for 34 years before retiring as a Lieutenant General in June of 2018. He's also an author. Mc, uh, General McMaster has written Dereliction of Duty, Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara and the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Lies That Led to Vietnam, and the forthcoming Battlegrounds, The Fight to Defend the Free World. He holds a PhD in military history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Next up, we'll have John Lee, who is uh, a professor and non-resident senior fellow at the US Study Center. He's also a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute in Washington. From 2016 to 2018, John was senior advisor to the Australian foreign minister, the lead ministerial advisor for the 2017 foreign policy white paper, and uh, Julie Bishop's principal advisor on the Indo-Pacific strategic affairs that led up to the reinstitution of the Quad in 2017. And perhaps to his chagrin, he's co-author with me of the U.S. Study Center report, The Future of U.S.-Australian Alliance in an Era of Great Power Competition. Most importantly, we have Dr. Lavina Lee, a senior lecturer in the Department of Modern History, Politics, and International Relations at Macquarie University. She's the author of the book, U.S. Hegemony, and has published numerous articles, book chapters, and commentary on Indian foreign and security policy, nuclear proliferation, and security relations in the Indo-Pacific. And pertinent here, she's the author of the recently released report, Assessing the Quad, Prospects and Limitations of Quadrilateral Cooperation for Advancing Australia's Interests. Here's how we'll do today. Each of the panelists will offer some framing remarks. We'll have a bit of a back and forth, and then I'll open it up to questions from all of you who are watching. One request to everyone who's listening. I will do my best to get through as many of your questions as possible and would just ask that when you submit a question in the Q&A box, please do not write a statement. I am trying to multitask. Just give me the question. I'll make sure I get it to the participants. General McMaster, over to you for your take on the quad from both a Japanese and an American perspective. Hey, thanks so much, Charlie. And, and thanks to Simon, John, and especially Levina to, to have the opportunity to be with you, at least virtually in, in, in Australia. And, uh, and, and thanks for the great work that the United States Studies Center does to help us understand better, not only you know, the, the, the problem sets that we face, but how we can work together uh, with the United States and Australia to advance our, our mutual interests. I'll tell you, I, I think <laughs> you're hard pressed to find uh, another country with, with, whom we're, with which we are better aligned in terms of our interests and, and our opportunities to work together than, than with Australia. Uh, you know, as, 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 a, as a military officer, I had just the great fortune of serving with so many distinguished Australian officers over the years, and, and it's a real pleasure, real pleasure to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity, and, and thanks for really bringing up a critical topic at a really critical time. I think everyone is aware now, uh, based on how aggressive the Chinese Communist Party has, has become in the wake of the, the COVID-19 crisis, the global recession, uh, and, and we see the, these increasingly aggressive actions in the South China Sea, uh, in vis-a-vis uh, -vis Taiwan, uh, ex extinguishing uh, individual rights in, 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 uh, in across its own country, uh, but then in Hong Kong uh, as well, and then most recently on the Indian China, Chinese border. So it couldn't be a, a more vital, I think, time for us to talk about this topic. Lavina, thank you so much for producing such an excellent report uh, at, at, the perf at the perfect time. And, and I think there's a lot of momentum on our side. I really do think there's more and more momentum behind the quad is, is not just an idea, but really a concrete way for us to work more effectively together. I think, I think you saw the, the, the tremendous momentum coming after Prime Minister Modi's and, and Prime Minister Morrison's recent meeting, the virtual summit uh, that they had. And so I, I think really more clearly now maybe than we have even in recent months is that we are in the midst of a very important competition, a very important competition between, uh, between really closed authoritarian system uh, that China is promoting uh, and, and our free and open systems. And it's in all of our interests 
to advance and, and protect our interests uh, and prevent the Chinese Communist Party uh, from, from, uh, from aggressively promoting uh, this, this authoritarian and, and closed uh, system. I think that the way this report is organized is exceptionally well done, Levina. And in particular, I, I really like the way that those mutual interests are right up front in the report. So what, what, why do we care? Why are all four of our countries, I think, intensely interested in, in this problem set and how we can work together? I, I think that the first is, is obviously we need to prevent China from accomplishing China's objectives in the Indo-Pacific region. And I believe that, that that objective is to create exclusionary areas of primacy uh, that, that China can dominate and dominate at the expense of other nations. And once China achieves that primacy, what it hopes to do and what it is actively actually pursuing now is to create servile relationships that replicate uh, the tributary system uh, and, and that, and that so, uh, force countries to subjugate their interests to the interests of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. So we want to prevent that from happening, right? There shouldn't be one belt and one road. There should be many belts, right? And many, and many roads. Uh, the, the, the second, I think the second key interest that's, that's in the report, I think is exceptionally well put, is obviously to deter force or coercion. I think what the Chinese Communist Party has become very adept at doing is co-opting countries. And then once they gain that kind of influence, to use that influence to coerce countries and in fact, private companies as well. Uh, to, to support their agenda uh, and to and to bend to the to the to the party's will, but what, really, what's most dangerous and what we see is a more and more aggressive People's Liberation Army. You know, scores of, of deaths now on, on the on the Indian Chinese border. It, it's just the latest example of, of increasingly aggressive actions by the Chinese Communist Party. And the third interest, right, the free movement of of goods and and services. And I would just add that really what what we need is we need free, fair, and reciprocal trade. And what China has done is, you know, it's entered, it's made a lot of promises over the years, kept none of them uh, in terms of, of, uh, of entrance into the WTO and the promises to remove non-tariff barriers to trade, uh, to stop its, its, uh, its economic aggressive actions, such as the forced transfer of intellectual property in exchange for, for access to the market. And of course, uh, we, we've been victims, all of us, of a sustained campaign of industrial espionage uh, as, as well. And then, and then the fourth interest is, is really rule of law, right? And, and, and the, the ability to, to maintain rule of law uh, and, and, uh, and, and, the, and the international order. Well, I mean, the, all, all of these interests are under duress based on the actions of the, of the Chinese Communist Party. And I think what we see today is the threats increasing because of a combination of fear and ambition on the part of the Chinese Communist Party leaders the fear of losing their, their exclusive grip on power. It, <laughs> this is the first time the Chinese, the, the Chinese economy uh, will, will not be growing uh, for, you know, for, uh, since 1978, right? It's, it's the first time they've had a recession since, since 1978. This creates anxiety on the part of the, of the, of the party that they might lose this exclusive grip on power. And then of course, this is connected to the ambition the great ambition of the party, the ambition associated with the agenda of national rejuvenation, you know, overcoming what they portray as, as the century of, of humiliation and taking, and taking center stage. And so I believe what the party sees now is what they had already recognized as a fleeting window of opportunity uh, to, to, to advance their interests in the region. They see that window closing faster. And so I think you're going to see more and more aggressive action, which is why this report, I think, is, is more important than, than, than ever. I think Xi Jinping, you know, he's, he has these anxieties, but I think he thinks he's winning, right? I mean, first of all, if you're Xi Jinping, you know, there aren't a lot of people around him who are going to tell him what they really think, right? It's kind of an echo chamber, right? Hey, great idea, you know, uh, chairman. Uh, and, 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 you know, I think there's this perception he's doing, he's doing, he's doing well. He's got hypersonic weapons. You know, they're coming out of the COVID crisis, even with the setbacks in Beijing, maybe ahead of the, of the, of the rest of the, of the world. And so I, I th and he sees in the United States, we have problems right now, right, that are, that are on the surface of our democracy um, in, involving COVID-19, the recession, uh, and, and now, of course, the racial discord and civil unrest and, 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 and public anger, right, over, over uh, police brutality after the murder of George Floyd. So he thinks he's winning, and he thinks the, the U.S. might be weak. And I think so, so this is, I think, is, is why it's, this is such a critical time.
So, so, the, so the quad, what, what should the quad focus on? I think it's a tremendous opportunity, the quad, first of all, because each country can identify, hey, here's, here's what I believe are competitive advantages relative to the other. And so we, we have the opportunity for really the synergistic application of, of power and, and influence uh, based on our competitive advantages. And that's, that's powerful in, in and of itself. I think that, that our militaries are complementary, as you saw in the summit uh, with, uh, with Prime Minister Morrison and Prime Minister Modi. That involves capabilities, but also basing opportunities and ways in which, ways in which we can improve our defense capabilities and get to that second interest that, that Lavina identified, which is to deter conflict. And, and then I think that, that the, third, or the th third item on the agenda, impose costs on China. Right? I mean, China gets away with it because China gets treated special, in a special manner for some reason. So as China continues this, the greatest land grab in history in the South China Sea uh, and continues to threaten Taiwan, um, extinguish human rights in, in, in its own country and in, in Hong Kong, takes these actions on the Indian border, it, there's, there, should be, there should be costs for this. Uh, and I think those should mainly be economic costs. And I think in large measure, the market ought to be imposing those costs. We could maybe talk more about that later. And then the fourth thing I think, what we can take on is we're all democracies. We're all democracies that operate in different ways. But what China wants everybody to believe is, hey, democracies are weak, right? Look what's going on in the United States. But democracies are strong, right? Because we are able to correct the course of our government short of revolution, right? I mean, we can, we can hold our government accountable and, 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 uh, and sovereignty rests with the people, right? Not with 1% you know, of the population who has an iron grip on, on the other 99% of the population. I think, I think there's tremendous momentum, as I mentioned, great timing here. You've already seen, you know, the, the, the hunger for rule of law. Look at what happened with the 1MDB scandal, right? I mean, it, it's clear what happens when you have corruption there. Look at what the Nigerian legislature just did in terms of the, these, these predatory belt and road uh, initiatives uh, with it, within Nigeria. Look at the calls for, you know, for free press and freedom of expression and how investigative reporters have exposed uh, a lot of the Chinese Communist Party's uh, uh, behavior. So, so I think these are four areas to focus. I'll highlight really two things just in conclusion here. Of all the members of the Quad, I think India is pivotal. <laughs> India is pivotal for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, everything's big in India, right? <laughs> you have big opportunities in India and you have big challenges in, our, in, in India. And I think we ought to all be working together to help India take advantage of its opportunities and address its, its, uh, its obstacles to progress. And this it would be maybe in particular in the interconnected problem sets of the environment, global warming, energy, food and water security. I mean, I think the Quad working together can set an example in India that will contrast with China, who's poisoning the world, who's poisoning its environment, who's exporting coal-fired plants uh, at, at increasing numbers you know, as, as an example. And then, and then I think the second thing, the second thing I think we can do across the Quad is to improve our, you know, is to stay true to our democratic principles. Hey, just we ought to recognize, right? Democracies are always works in progress. And, and we ought to be confident about that. We ought to feel good that we live in, in, a de in democratic nations and, and, and reject this idea from China that, that, that really that, that are the elements of our democracy are, are weaknesses. They're not weaknesses, they're strengths. But I, I'm really excited for the discussion. I can't wait to hear the other panelists and, and join in the discussion with you. Lavina, thank you again for this gift you've given us uh, at, at, the, uh, at the perfect time. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, General McMaster. Uh, let's take it uh, down to Australia now for a different perspective. And John, uh, how has, how does Australia think about the prospects of a quad? You were there uh, in government on the revival of the quad in 2017. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, I remember the, the question of whether Australia should push for and join a reform quad came up in the first half of 2017. And as you mentioned, I was still deep in a term of government uh, at the time. Uh, at the time, Australia was on a nose with China already then because we had taken a very strong view on the South China Sea, particularly arbitration decision in 2016. But on the Quad, we knew the Japanese were keen, particularly under Prime Minister Abe. The Americans and HR was in government then. The Americans were, were very keen and the Indians were warming to it. Um, I had been very uh, forward leaning on a quad, both before I entered government and inside the government. So my position was very well known. 
Uh, but there was a lot of debate within the Turnbull government then about whether Australia should push for it or, or join on if, if it were to be reinstituted. And I remember, uh, I can't remember the exact date, but in 2017 sometime, there was a very robust uh, internal document setting out the reasons why we should not join the Quad. That was just an internal discussion paper, but a very uh, uh, high level or senior document uh, giving the reasons why we should not join the Quad. And to give it a very crude summary, uh, the top two reasons given were one, it would further annoy the Chinese, uh, and two, it would certainly annoy the ASEAN countries who would see the Quad as a threat to uh, so-called ASEAN centrality that is allow ASEAN to ostensibly uh, drive and define the diplomatic agenda in the region. Now, I remember around the table uh, in discussing this document about why not to join the Quad, my political masters at the time turned to me and said to me, all right, this is a very uh, uh, robust document, why we shouldn't do it. John, give me your top two reasons why we should join the Quad. Uh, and I have to admit my top two reasons, my answer wasn't original. I said, one, it would annoy the Chinese, and two, it would certainly annoy the ASEANs. They're my top two reasons. Now, this is a true story, and in case you think I'm being facetious, uh, let me give you some more substantial or strategic reasons why I held that position, uh, which will also speak to, I think, what we might get out of the Quad. First, China. Think about China's uh, broad strategic approach to the region. Uh, one of the things that it wants to do, it wants to uh, simplify and eliminate as many strategic players as possible. It does that by silencing them, by neutralising them, or by isolating them. It certainly does, doesn't want a coordinated or coalition against, uh, against Beijing. Now, China fears the Quad. It did then and it does now, not just because it has four of the most capable navies or amongst the four most capable navies from the Indo-Pacific, but it's the four countries with the most combative psychology in the region when it comes to countering uh, Chinese actions. Uh, there aren't many things that really cause Beijing to reconsider uh, its actions and to recalculate, but the Quad has the potential to do that, and I emphasise the word potential. Uh, now let me get to the usefulness uh, or the strategic usefulness of annoying the ASEANs, who I hold close to my heart, but, but still sometimes annoying the right, right entities can be uh, the, the right thing to do. Now, all ASEAN members formally insist on ASEAN centrality, and they overtly advocate principles of neutrality and inclusiveness. Uh, but they're increasingly, and they were increasingly, ignoring the strategic cost to them and the other countries of doing so. Uh, so ASEAN says it doesn't want to take sides. It wants to be neutral. The problem is that doesn't work when you have one country, that is China, changing the maritime, the territorial and the strategic status quo. So the analogy I use then when I was inside government, and I've, I've said so publicly, particularly when I speak to the ASEANs, is this. It's kind of like you having a big neighbour next to you and every month the neighbour wants an extra metre of your land, of your backyard. Now, if you meet your neighbour halfway, every month you lose 50 centimetres of your backyard. That's kind of what's happening um, in terms of the dynamics between a lot of the Southeast Asian states and uh, China at the moment. Um, the point is that the ASEANs were more stressed about Australia and other countries reformulating the Quad uh, than many other things that they ought to have far, been far more stressed about. That itself was a worrying sign. Uh, but the point from the Australian point of view was that ASEAN centrality, if that is to hold, has responsibilities. Uh, if ASEAN refuses or doesn't adequately consider its own interests and those of other countries in the region, then several of its own member states, and here I have in mind particularly Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, and other countries like Australia will be forced to make their own arrangements. And 
because of that ASEAN centrality will be diluted if it doesn't step up. The Quad, of course, is one of those arrangements, which is to say, uh, without uh, trying to put too blunt a point of it, that ASEAN is somewhat on notice. Now, will the Quad work? Uh, I will put it this way. Uh, the Quad, I am confident the Quad will be what it needs to be. And what it needs to be will largely, not only, but largely depend on Chinese behaviour, uh, which I think was one of the driving forces behind its reinstitution. Uh, the Quad has been formed between the four countries that have, I think, decisively chosen to counter and balance against China. Uh, and they see doing that as the only viable strategic option. Now, there will be differences in emphasis and on issues of interest, but that desire to balance and counter, I think, unites four members. Now, from my experience, the uh, conversations between Quad members, I'm talking from ministerial to senior official to, uh, to embassies, uh, they're starting to take on a real point of differentiation from other conversations. Uh, it is increasingly action orientated uh, and discussion is about genuinely strategic options. Uh, this doesn't actually happen as often as many people would believe between countries in our region, but it's certainly starting or has, it is happening between the Quad countries. Uh, we can talk and we will talk about more specific things that the Quad can or should do shortly, uh, but conversations around cooperation, uh, when it comes to infrastructure, financing, maritime and naval activities, cyber, technical cooperation, uh, export controls, all those sorts of things, they are becoming far more strategic and tactical between Quad members uh, uh, compared to much of the region. Charles, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, I'll, I'll uh, come back in during question time, uh, certainly. Thank you. Well, thanks, John, for those comments. You're reminding me uh, of a moment maybe about a year ago or so when we were both up in Jakarta uh, talking with our ASEAN friends, uh, and the point was made to uh, to you uh, after such robust comments, and perhaps to me, uh, that you have to understand that we enjoy sitting on the fence. That's what ASEAN does, but we see a train coming towards us, and we're not sure what to do, uh, which would give you apparently two options, continue sitting or get run over. Uh, but with that, let me... Um, hand it to Lavina, who's just written this terrific report assessing the Quad with a particular focus on where India stands. So Lavina, I was hoping that you might be able to walk us through how you see the risk reward calculus in Delhi. Thanks, Charlie. Um, look, I, I thought I'd start with, um, well, I'm responsible for India and I think India is seen to be um, the one player that's held the quad back um, in terms of deepening its relations. And I, I've been to India a number of times in the last couple of years, and I've spoken to many officials and researchers about the quad. And I've always pressed them on why India has yet to invite Australia to join the Malabar naval exercises, for example. And their basic response is this. Uh, why deepen quad cooperation? What's in it for us? Um, Australia and Japan are allies of the United States. The three of them already work very closely together. So why should we stick our necks out and unnecessarily anger China, given that we have the most to lose? And I think in many ways, um, these officials uh, are right. India does share many interests and values with the other members of the Quad, including uh, many of the things um, mentioned already, uh, including the, the desire to maintain a stable balance of power to ensure that uh, China doesn't dominate our region. Um, but India stands out from the other three because of its greater vulnerability to Chinese re retaliation and its lesser capacity to absorb any punishment that might come its way as a result of deepening quad cooperation. And I think there are a number of points of vulnerability for India that have restrained its responses to Chinese pro provocations in the past. And I think we're, we're witnessing the first point of vulnerability now, the, the long almost three and a half thousand kilometer 
undemarcated border between India and China, where the line of actual control is challenged by China on a very regular and recurring basis. So what we're seeing now is not unusual, it's just worse than ever. Now, while India has improved its border infrastructure and its high altitude war fighting capabilities, China is still considered to have a considerable advantage. Second, um, China could very well increase its already significant political and economic support for Pakistan and could decide to encourage Islamabad to challenge the line of act actual control in Jammu and Kashmir directly or through proxies. India also still has very significant development needs, which it means, which means it can't compete in an arms race with China. For example, India currently has a four times smaller annual military budget than China. Four, I'd say India is also vulnerable to the imposition of cost by China in its maritime space. China has significantly improved its power projection capabilities into the Indian Ocean. And this is viewed in New Delhi as a deliberate plan uh, to shrink India's strategic space whilst using the BRI and debt trap diplomacy to extend influence over India's smaller neighbours like Bangladesh, the Maldives and Sri Lanka. And last, India is limited by its strategic culture. Now this culture prioritises maximum strategic autonomy and as a result, India deliberately foregoes formal alliances in favour of multi, multiple strategic partnerships. Now this means it can't and doesn't expect direct involvement of other countries in its border problems with China and Pakistan. But because of these vulnerabilities, for a very long time, India's mindset has been to play down differences with China, to reset or smooth over relations where there has been conflict, and to avoid any perception that there's any competition between the two. Now, at the same time, I see things have been changing. And I think these trends have now been cemented by the first Indian and Chinese casualties on the border uh, for the last 45 years that happened this week. And I think this is because of two, two things that are interrelated. Now, the first is the change in India's mindset. Um, under the leadership of Narendra Modi and the BJP, India has shown much more appetite for standing up for its national interests as demonstrated by its firm response to China's attempts to change the, st the status quo in the Doklam Plateau in 2017, but also in the current border clashes. And on its border, India is showing that it does understand that China's salami slicing tactics do work unless they're opposed whilst in progress. Now, the second thing I've, I've noted is that um, it's, it's uh, all to do with, in terms of Ch Ch India's uh, change approach, is China's aggressive behaviour. So um, what is becoming increasingly obvious is that previous attempts to reset the relationship between India and China, to play down differences, to forego deepening strategic relations with like-minded states, like the Quad countries, and avoid direct countering of adverse Chinese policies to avoid raising Beijing's ire has not actually resulted in any tangible gains or rewards for India. So China has, has not compromised in its political and strategic aims on its border with India, in the Indian Ocean, in its relations with Pakistan, despite all of India's attempts at conciliation so um, turning to your question, will the Quad work? I think on current trends, I do think it will. Um, given China's increasingly aggressive behaviour, India will come to value the leverage that the Quad brings. It's a way for India and the other Quad countries to signal to China that there are real costs attached to undermining the status quo, and that together the Quad can develop an in and signal an increasing capability and resolve to inflict costs for bad behaviour should the need arise. So just as India has vulnerabilities, so too does China. And these vulnerabilities are things that Quad countries collectively can exploit. And Beijing understands this, it knows this, 
hence why it alternates between derision and protest at deepening cooperation by the Quad countries. So there are many opportunities for the Quad to demonstrate this collective resolve to counter. Uh, yes, in terms of military cooperation, but also economically and politically. And I'd be glad to expand on that even more in the Q&A. So I'll leave it at that, Charlie. Uh, terrific. Uh, and thank, uh, thank you to all of you for a really terrific and robust set of opening comments. Um, first uh, question, because we have an awful lot of ground to cover here, um, which isn't a question for one of you so much as for all of you. Um, but in 2017, uh, Andrew Shearer, who is now serving as Australia's cabinet secretary, wrote that the quad had to be, quote, driven by function rather than form. Uh, so I guess my question is, what functions should it focus on at this moment? What capacities do you think it should invest in? And which function should it defer or even forswear? Um, let me uh, maybe ask, uh, let's sit, keep it in the order that we started with. So General McMaster, if you have some thoughts on that. Uh, first of all, I, I think that this is really for the quad to decide, right? And I think one of the points that was made earlier is very important. I think oftentimes these multinational fora uh, tend to, to, to really respond to what's happening immediately. You know, what, what do we do about X issue or that or this other issue? I think what the, what the Quad should do is focus on really trying to understand better what is the, what is the threat, uh, what, what are the threats to, to their mutual security and, and, uh, and, and their interests, uh, and then develop a strategy, a strategy to, to take it on uh, in a sustained manner over time. So it, I mentioned just briefly in, in an introductory remarks, it ought to be to try to, to magnify the competitive advantages of, of each of the countries and maybe to, to compensate for relative weaknesses. So let's just take a look at a couple of examples, right? First of all, we know that China is advancing its, its ac activities through, uh, through a number of strategies. Uh, first of all, it is, is, the, is the strategy of, of military civil fusion, right? And, and this is really an effort to gain access to sensitive technologies and apply those technologies to dominating the emerging data economy, uh, but then to have differential advantages militarily. Uh, John already mentioned, you know, the need for us to cooperate together on export controls. Now, it's not just cooperating among the four of us, but all of us obviously have very strong diplomatic relations with other free and open countries. I think one of the powers of the Quad is then to be able to, to, to take those standards of export control and all of us you know, make the case separately or together, whatever works uh, with the EU and with the UK and, and others. Because of course, what China's adept at is playing everybody off against each other. Uh, in the area of military capabilities, each of us have relative strengths and, and weaknesses. I think we ought to encourage Japan uh, to develop a much more robust uh, defense capability as, as Levina re recommends in the, uh, in the study uh, as well. And, and so I, I think what we want to do is we want to deny China the, the ability to coerce countries in the region uh, into, as John said, you're giving up 50 centimeters you know, every, every year. Uh, and, and so that's an important aspect of it. As far as the, the predatory policies under One Belt, One Road, as you know, we've been working very closely together and Japan, I think, really took the, the lead uh, on, tr on, on the transparency standards and other standards for, in, for international and infrastructure investment. And the Quad countries have joined in, in that call. Uh, to, to, to counter these predatory actions. Uh, and then I think, you know, th there are such a broad range of actions <laughs> and activities that the Chinese Communist Party is, is involved in, uh, in cyber espionage. Uh, remember the indictments that, that the U.S. Department of Justice made in December of 2018. Fifteen countries, I think, altogether joined those indictments and, and sanctions. And it's the Quad, I think, who can bring those other countries together, galvanize action, um, Against uh, against these these aggressive policies under you know under one belt one road under under military uh, civil fusion and under made in China twenty twenty five. John, did you want to happen? The um, the call to focus on function rather than form, I think that really arose because a lot of us at the time were getting at this funk about you know. How many times should the Quad work uh, meet? How, you, should it be on the sidelines of ASEAN meetings or separately? Should it be ministerial, senior official? And, and, you know, as you know, being in government yourselves and those who have been, these sorts of questions um, can take up a lot of time and not achieve a lot of results. So 
the issue of focusing on function was really to ask, well, this is my version of it, not necessarily Andrew's, was to ask, well, what are these four countries actually good at? Um, and you look, you look at the capabilities we have. So I'll point out two or three areas. As I mentioned, we're all very capable maritime countries. Now, I'm conscious you need to draw India in. So what's one objective, for example? It's to make sure that an Indian Ocean doesn't become like the South China Sea. Now, that's certainly something that would draw in all four countries. Uh, you look at infrastructure and the financing of infrastructure. India has its own uh, debt trap economies on its borders, Sri Lanka, for example, which, which fell to that trap uh, with respect to China. Uh, the financing of infrastructure particularly is something that the four countries can certainly uh, cooperate on. And finally, technology. I, I briefly mentioned export controls. Uh, you know, it sounds like a throwaway line, but the four countries with significant technological capabilities have to cooperate and agree on a set of export controls to create an ecosystem that isn't infiltrated by uh, Chinese and other powers who will use those technologies for uh, purposes that would, would be against our interests. So that would be my, my, my comment. Focus on what we're good at and, and go ahead and do it. And in, in terms of who meets where, when, that will work itself out later. Uh, Lavina, if you don't mind, I'd actually like to go not to function, not towards you know, lines of effort and deconfliction, but actually to contemporary events, which uh, a bunch of you have already alluded to. Now, uh, already in the Q&A, we're getting a whole bunch of questions coming in about what's happening on that Himalayan border that China and India share. Trevlin Gilmore, Ritesh Kumar, Brad Glosserman all had similar questions that they've populated the Q&A box. And I guess I'd be curious for your take about, um, is the Quad relevant to the current situation between China and India on that disputed border? Uh, you know, some have argued that this, if anything, makes for a quad moment. Uh, what do you think? Uh, will it make India more receptive to affirming up of the quad or perhaps less given that this conflict is wholly on maritime in nature? Um, look, I, I think um, going back to what I said in the my framing remarks is that I actually think that um, what is happening on the border actually helps, uh, you know, China's actually helping um, what uh, I think a, a lot of us have been trying to encourage India to, to deepen cooperation with other Quad countries. And it's been very reticent in the past because it's been reticent about, well, what's the consequences if we, if we deepen our, our military cooperation with um, Australia and the United States and Japan, maybe China will hit us on the border or hit us with Pakistan. But I think this is showing that um, even if India restrains itself, um, China's aggressive behavior continues and it sees that as a signal that others are around it are, are weakened, um, that they don't have the resolve and mindset to counter. And as long as you don't have that resolve and mindset to counter, then you're actually emboldening China rather than placating it. So I think um, that what, what's happening on the border has direct relevance to the Quad. Um, that India, I think, will look look at the Quad uh, as a as a means of ratcheting up le leverage over China and perhaps deterring uh, deterring China from being more aggressive on the border because now India has another string to its bow and can say, okay, well, if you're going to do things to us uh, on the border or in Pakistan, then we've actually got a a, a group of friends here, and we can echoing what I think. Um, General McMaster and, and John have already talked about, but there are a wide range of issues that uh, China will be very um, worried about coordinated action uh, to counter its policies. And so far, um, we haven't coordinated as well as we could have, and we're, we're getting, I think we're getting our act together now, definitely, um, but there's definitely more that can be done. So um, if you say it, you're, question was, is there a connection? Yes, I think there is a connection. In, um, China does have ambitions, aims and objectives in the maritime space. And um, India will play and can play a very big role in that. Um, you know, another question uh, that we're seeing come in from a, a bunch of different folks, and you all have already alluded to this, 
is does the Quad mean anything uh, beyond the context of China? Um, is that the whole driver? Now, uh, several of you have noted about potential other areas of coordination, infrastructure build, export control, supply chain coordination. Um, but when we talk about it just in the context of China, does that narrow the focus too much? Uh, we got a question from uh, the retired uh, Rear Admiral uh, from the Indian Navy, Admiral Shrikande. If we still want to keep saying in Quad meetings that the Quad is not against China per se, then what is the center of gravity for Quad as a collective strength? Um, I'll turn that over to any of you if you want to take a stab at that question. Uh, I'll, I'll take a very quick stab and hand off. Um, China has shown us what we need to resist. We need to resist certain forms of predatory economics. We need to resist outright uh, military and particularly maritime coercion. We need to resist political coercion uh, and we need to guard our institutions. In a sense, uh, even if China disappeared tomorrow, those principles, those, the importance of resisting those things will still exist. Um, so, you know, there is enough uh, uh, similarities between the interests and values of the Quad members to pursue those things. But you have to say that were it not for China, um, we probably wouldn't really need to talk about a more formalised Quad structure. So there is enough binding us um, in, in terms of what we share from our interests and values point of view. But yes, it is true that it is China that's really driven the urgency and the importance and timeliness of the court. I would just add, and, and, and uh, I would just add that, that we have an interest in making ourselves better as well. And that's a really important part of the competition. I mentioned some of the issues that we could cooperate on, on on energy and climate and food security and water security uh, that are especially important to all of our countries and to the world. Uh, I think associated with that are, are the development uh, and, and, uh, and enforcement of international standards. So I think the four countries really working together in areas of mutual interest, to not just to counter uh, China's effort to subvert standards or to, or to capture standards, but to, to put in place positive standards that are, that are good for the, the world. I think India's uh, leadership uh, for reform within the, the World Health Organization, I think would be, is immensely important. And of course, all of us are involved in different international fora. For example, I think India's voice within the BRICS forum can prevent a lot of bad things from happening <laughs> and, set, and set a positive agenda, for example, uh, there as, as well. So I, I think it shouldn't just be limited to China just in terms of countering each and every form of Chinese aggression, but it should be, I think, to promoting you know, our free and open societies and standards associated with those uh, in a way that advances all, all the interests of, of all free peoples, you know. And I, and I think that an element of this that, 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 that the Quad could take on is to prevent the Chinese Party's subversion of international organizations, as we've seen them become particularly adept at that in, in recent years. Um, I'd like to uh, begin to bring in even more of the uh, people who are watching right now. And uh, one of the questions that we got uh, is not about the general principles, but actually about some of the frictions that exist between our four countries. Uh, and uh, Jim Caruso, who uh, should be known by many on this call, he formerly uh, served as the DCM uh, here at the U.S. Embassy in Canberra, uh, asked whether or not um, India is over its mistrust of Australia regarding China uh, that resulted uh, from Australia pulling out of the last Quad effort in 2008 during the uh, Rudd administration. Uh, would love to hear what your interviews turned up, Lavina, on that. Um, look, I think you, you could just look to the, the latest meeting, the virtual meeting between Australia and um, India only a few weeks ago. Um, and I think I, I think it's well on its way. Uh, I wouldn't say completely over, but uh, definitely um, India is looking at Australia more, more and more as a, a consistent partner. So there, there definitely was a problem there. Every time I'd go to India for the last few years, um, this abandonment of the Quad was always brought up. Um, our, our decision not to sell India uranium uh, was a, a real sore point. 
Um, but I think there's been real consistent advocacy of, um, of our position to the Indians, how much we value them. Um, but I think also there was a perception that Australia itself was very compromised, that our relationship with China, our, our economic relationship, meant that we couldn't and wouldn't really take hard decisions um, to defend our interests. But I'm, I think the last two years, um, 2017 onwards, um, I think it's pretty unmistakable that Australia is one of the, the leading countries when it comes to standing up against um, adverse Chinese policies, whether that's defending our, uh, our de democratic institutions, our open government, but also in calling out uh, bad behaviour by China internationally. So if anything, I think that has given India a greater confidence in Australia and its reliability. Um, one of the questions that we're seeing come in from a lot of folks is the, um, uh, the uh, crawl, walk or run uh, and in what sequence? That is, uh, should the quad be the starting point or the end point? Uh, are there other countries uh, in Southeast Asia that this might expand to? Uh, John, during your comments, you talked about how various ASEAN nations thought about uh, ambiguously uh, the quad. Um, curious uh, to hear whether or not each of you think that the quad should be bigger than just four different members um, and how that might be evaluated from other nations uh, that have significant uh, maritime interests, no less broader interests. We've mentioned Vietnam, we've mentioned Indonesia and Singapore amongst others. John? Um, the first thing to note, you know, as I raise is that you look at the four quad countries and, and this is really important. They are the four countries most prepared psychologically and strategically and politically to counter and balance China. Um, and also have significant capabilities in doing that. If you look at the Southeast Asian countries and even the other countries in the region, I don't think South Korea is there yet psychologically. Vietnam is, but Vietnam um, is, is, is still a, uh, it's a significant power, but it doesn't have the same capabilities at this stage. Uh, and, and it also, to be upfront, has a somewhat different political system, which would create some, some potential difficulties in a quad framework. So for me, the four countries of the quad, it's not that it has to be exclusive in per perpetuity, but they are the four countries that are moving together uh, from a psychological and strategic point of view. And, and I, my view is that we should sort of bed that basic framework or institution between our four countries first um, before we even think about formally expanding the organization. All right, that's the definitive word there. Um, you know, I know I'm conscious of the time here uh, that we're winding down, but we're really getting a ton of really good questions and good discussion here. Um, and General McMaster, uh, you had mentioned several times about the common values that these four nations share and that other nations share. Uh, trying to keep a free and open region. We got a, one particularly pointy question here, which I think is uh, really interesting from uh, Misha Zelensky uh, of the Australian Workers Union. Uh, and he asked about, um, given political warfare is designed to cause maximum damage to democracies without drawing a kinetic response, how can democracies call this behavior out? Uh, is it useful to, to call it warfare? and how should they respond in kind or differently? Well, I, I, think, I think that it's a great question because I think the question already alluded to what, what really one of the most important elements of the response to this kind of a threat of political subversion using really mainly cyber enabled information warfare. I think it's useful to call it warfare. It's a form of, I think, trying to impose you know, one's will or to shatter our, our, our will uh, to be able to defend ourselves, prevent us from defending ourselves. And it makes it helps you think about the, the really competitive nature of, of that that you know, that, uh, that activity, and and I think that the first way to deal with it is to expose it. Right, that's the first way to, to, to cope with it. And I think I think all of our countries are becoming much better at this. Uh, as you know, it's not just in the cyber domain; it's a broad range of influence actions. John Garneau was the leader of this. I mean, that study was just so well done, 
and, I, and there have been many others now that have been modeled off of it. At Hoover, we, we completed one about a year and a half ago under Larry Diamond and Orville Shell of the, of the Asian Society. Uh, and I think many others, New Zealand, others have taken on now this, this problem of, 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 uh, of, of political warfare uh, that we see now in, in a, the most brazen form with this wolf warrior diplomacy. Um, and as ham-handed as that has been, and, and I think created blowback against the Chinese Communist Party, I don't think their enthusiasm for it is, is diminished. But I, I do think that, that there is an element of protecting ourselves by strengthening our own civil society. And it's great to have a, 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 this uh, question from someone who's involved with the labor union. I think that, that really there's a big educational dimension to this, especially in, in, uh, in ensuring that our citizens understand the virtues of our free and open democratic system. And, and we recognize the, you know, the opportunities that we have in our free market economic system as well. Uh, the importance of protecting that. And so I, I think, I think there's, there's a, a dimension of, of exposing it, of countering it, uh, using a broad range of, of, of means, um, defensive means. But I, but, I, but, but I think that defense carries over into, into really understanding better who we are and trying to rebuild some of the confidence, uh, at least in, in the United States, I think at this stage in particular, in the experiences we've had, confidence in our democratic principles and institutions and processes. Uh, final question here, because uh, you guys have all been terrific with your time and really articulate in the answers. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, note, because multiple audience members, clearly having read the news, uh, had a similar question. Um, and this is really uh, a pointy question about uh, General McMaster's successor, uh, John Bolton, who has a new book out, who had an article out yesterday uh, in the Wall Street Journal about uh, China and the Trump administration's reaction to it. Um, what he alleged in this piece was that President Trump was strategically incompetent when dealing with China, that he was wholly focused on personal and political benefit at the expense of strategic competition and the national interest. Uh, now, I want to say any of you are welcome to comment on that piece and that allegation, but maybe a, a different way of approaching this would also be what are your concluding thoughts on what strategic competence would look like and what it would demand uh, from each of our countries? I'll, you know, I'll, take, I'll take it. Right? And, and what I'll just say first is that I think the, that the shift in U.S. policy toward China is it's just a fact, right? It's demonstrable. And I think what you've seen under the Trump administration uh, and what we, I was part of, you know, in, in the, you know, the 13 months that I was on duty there uh, in, in the White House uh, was, was to affect really, I think was the greatest shift in U.S. foreign policy since at least the end of the Cold War. And we did it. I think this is an element of strategic competence is we assessed our policy toward China by first understanding the assumptions on which our policy had been based. We found that they were largely implicit. <laughs> and because they were implicit, they were unchallenged, and they were funded. They were demonstrably false and, and flawed. And so we we developed a new set of assumptions on which our, that policy would be based. We recognized that China, having been welcomed into the international order, was not going to liberalize its economy, play by the rules, and as it prospered, liberalize its form of governance. In fact, the opposite was was the case. And so we we came up with a new strategy. We we we, we designated China as a strategic competitor. Uh, and, and it really the unclassified version of this is in the December 2017 National Security Strategy. But you see evidence of it in the administration's actions. When people say, hey, there's no strategy. Well, what about those indictments in December of 2018? Wasn't that maybe an element of strategy? What about the reinvigoration of the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States? Isn't that kind of a strategy? What about, is that an element of strategy? What, what about the, the investments in, in defense uh, and, and, the, and the vast increase uh, in, in naval operations, for example, in the South China Sea and in the region broadly, maybe that's an, an element of the strategy. What about countering uh, Chinese cyber, uh, cyber uh, and, and, and industrial espionage uh, activities? And I could just go on and on about look, you know, exa examining the, country, the companies that are listed on, on U.S. Uh, stock exchanges. I mean, so I, there's a huge list of actions that the Trump administration has taken really in concert with, with allies and, and partners. And I think that, that when you add that up, that's the implementation of the strategy to confront the aggressive policies of the Chinese Communist Party. 
and to compete more effectively. Yeah, I don't think we were competing. You know, we weren't even on the on the on the pitch. You know, with uh, with with China's Communist Party because we had vacated these arenas of competition, and and um, and so I, I just I just don't think it's true so, uh, that 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 that, uh, uh, that the Trump administration has been soft on China. I don't agree with every specific decision. You know. Uh, but, but I do think that it's a fundamental shift. And what's notable about this, and I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry to go on, but I think this is a really important point. Is so there are, you may not, I don't know if anybody noticed this, but there aren't a whole lot of issues where you have bipartisan consensus in the United States these days, right? And China is, is one of those issues where there is bipartisan consensus about the threat that the policies of the Chinese Communist Party poses to our free and open societies and the need for us to compete much more effectively. So I think there, I think I know there is a strategy, uh, like all strategies, it's probably implemented imperfectly. Uh, but but I think I think that we're moving in the right direction as a country, and I believe that will be sustained through future administrations, regardless of which party uh, puts that puts that president into into the administration, or who the American people elect. Thanks for that. Uh, before we close out, uh, Lavina, uh, any concluding thoughts on strategic competence and what it entails, not only from the United States, but from all uh, allied and like-minded nations on this? Um, okay, well, I, I think, um, you know, I, General McMaster is completely correct in saying that uh, we're really in that phase now of, of strategic competition. So whatever uh, ambiguities there might have been before, especially when we were talking about the court in 2007, I think are now completely absent. Um, so uh, look, I, I look at the Trump administration and yes, there are problems from a perspective from a um, middle power country. Uh, we would prefer to see more use of institutions uh, and bringing more partners along into a lot of these decisions that are being made, which I think we, uh, Australia, broadly agrees with these policies, but to have as many people uh, brought along as possible is, is a good thing. Um, but I see that the Quad uh, is, is, you know, it's a, it's a tight group of really, uh, as John uses the words, forward-leaning, uh, the, the countries with the mindset to, to counter. Um, I think we can, as a group, as the Quad countries, can propel a lot of the, the policies that uh, General McMaster was just talking about beyond, I, I think the military aspect is is very important, um, and and that's the thing I always get asked about first is, you know, when are when are we going to see um, greater military cooperation? I think that's going to come. I think it's going to come pretty soon. It's going to come incrementally. Um, it'll it'll happen in a way that allows the grouping um, to ratchet up its leverage over China in accordance with how China behaves. So it's a, it's a deterrent um, mechanism. Um, so I, I think if, if there's only one thing that I would criticize, it's, it's the, um, probably the, the lack of attention to America's institutional power, um, that America led many of the institutions in the post-war um, world uh, and that it shouldn't abdicate uh, the space and allow China to enter it and to dominate, it should continue to lead institutionally. Um, and the Quad is, a, is, is a, a way forward, but I think also more broadly speaking, it should extend to, to things like the WTO, sorry, WHO and the WTO, I should say. Thanks, Lavina. John, uh, final thoughts? Sure, thanks for giving me the, the, the final word. Look, if you're in Tokyo or New Delhi or Canberra, you are probably more fearful of a timid United States than an impulsive United States. You know, I served uh, in the Australian government a year during the Obama administration and a year during the Trump administration. My concern uh, after that first year was that when something happened in the region or when some, when a capital was doing something, whether it's China or Beijing or some other capital, Everyone asked, what will China do next? No one asked, what will the United States do next? Or how will the United States respond? Now, that changed uh, during the Trump administration. I mean, I can't speak to Donald Trump's personal characteristics, but uh, his administration has made some bold decisions that would not otherwise have been made, I don't think, by another administration. 
Now, whether it's to be a Trump or a Biden administration next year, those, many of those decisions will stand. Uh, so I, I don't think the Trump administration has been uh, neglectful, certainly, of the challenge posed by China. Terrific. Well, uh, thank you very much for all this. I, I would also note in that um, interesting piece by uh, Mr. Bolton yesterday, uh, one of the more interesting ones was speculation on where the Democrats would go under uh, Biden. And apparently, uh, according to John Bolton, he said, you don't want the Democrats, they'll be worse than me. So uh, at the very least, we can say that this is bipartisan, even as assessed by Donald Trump. Uh, I'd like to conclude, though, by thanking all of you for these terrific set of comments, a really insightful uh, conversation here. Uh, what all of you who are watching this don't get to see, though, is the extraordinary team we have working at the U.S. Study Center. Uh, Janine, Mara, Suze, Taylor, and Mari, who just do such a fantastic job to make sure that all of this runs flawlessly. So thank uh, you to them uh, very much. Also wanted to uh, tee up that next Tuesday, we have our next webinar on Tech Wars, US-China technology competition and what it means for Australia by the United States Study Center's very own Brendan Thomas uh, known. Uh, so please uh, tune into that. Uh, check out the website where this will be up, both the recording and uh, God help us, probably the video as well. Uh, and with that, we'll sign off and thank you all very much uh, for your time. Good day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.